Hello everybody, my name is Elena and I'm a K-5 through Behavior Special Education teacher in the state of Iowa and this is my vlog. In today's vlog, I'm going to tell you guys, it's going to be kind of a story time. A couple weeks back, somebody had commented on one of my videos asking if I could talk about how and why I made the transition from being a gen ed teacher to teaching special education. And so I just figured now would be the best time of any to just kind of sit, sit down and talk you through that story and my journey from how I got to where I was to where I am now. I kind of feel like in a way this is a little bit of like a job interview question because I have definitely talked through this journey in job interviews in the past and how I got here but most recently that would have been three years ago when I took this position so it's been a while since I've kind of talked through this but for anybody who is new to my channel I taught uh, in the gen ed, gen ed setting for six years and then this is my third year in special education so I started off teaching fifth grade. I taught fifth grade for five years. Then my boyfriend got a job as an assistant principal in a town that was a couple hours away, still within the state, but we moved kind of across the state to take this new position. And so when he took that new position, I decided I wanted you know, to change it up a little bit and to try a new grade level. So then I taught third grade for a year. I loved fifth grade and the district that I was in, but when we made the move, I just decided I was ready to try something a little bit different and challenge myself a little bit. The fifth graders were so much fun to have real conversations with, but in the district I was in, they were still in elementary school. So, you know, we didn't, they're kind of middle school-ish, but they were kind of, the they were the oldest kids in the building, so there was a little bit of the kind of top dog attitude. And if you've taught fifth grade, I think you understand, or even if it's sixth grade, but they're the oldest kids in the building, then you kind of understand where that attitude a little bit comes from. So, of course, that was a little challenging. Uh, but when I was in my last year of teaching fifth grade, I decided I wanted to start getting my master's. I had known for a long time I wanted to get my master's. I didn't know what I wanted to get it in throughout my first five years of teaching, I really started to see myself gravitate towards students with behavioral challenges. And I loved working with my students who had IEP goals and you know needed that extra help. I just found it very fascinating and kind of a puzzle, if you will, of how we were gonna figure out their best supports that they needed, how we were going to teach this lesson or this concept to make it make sense to this student, whether it was academic goals or behavioral things. I just found myself drawn towards helping those students with those challenges. And that's really where my heart was. So I knew finally by that fifth year of teaching, I realized that I wanted to get my master's in special education. So then you dive into special education and I am not familiar with how other states do this, but in Iowa, there's a couple different lanes you can go down with special education. So to start with, there's a strat one and a strat two. If you're a strat one, that's a resource position. It's academic goals, mild, moderate disabilities. Some kids might have social, emotional, behavioral goals, but not very intense. Kids who probably don't have a bunch of associate minutes, like maybe some for academic help, but probably don't have a safety plan like that's kind of what level one resource is then you can have a strat two position and within the strat two there's two different strands you can go down so you can have a strat two license with a bd ld endorsement which is what i have so behavior disorder learning disability or you can have bd id and that would be behavior disorder intellectual disability so within at least my school the way we call it there's strat 2 license but then there's a level 2 teacher so i'm a level 2 teacher strat 2 like bdld is a level 2 position here but then we call it level 3 down the rest of the hallway which are still strat 2 positions but they have the bdid endorsement so the intellectual disabilities we have a lot more 
kids with severe and profound autism diagnosis, Down syndrome, more intellectually disabled students, kids who are on alternate assessment, that kind of thing. So we have three different classrooms in my school with those kinds of needs that we're serving. And then the students on my roster have a lot more of like emotional disturbances, uh, behavior disorders, autism diagnosis. I do have some students with pretty significant communication challenges who use core boards and communication and I'm in constant contact with our SLP on their communication goals as well. Like not just a speech thing, like actual communication where they're not able to formulate their own sentences and speak. It's what's known as just alt language processing or having echolalia. Anyways, uh, but all the kids that I serve have behavior disorder goals where it's like severe, intense, we, you know, have safety plans. People in here have to be trained in how you safely restrain a student, uh, those kinds of things. That got a little off track, I feel like. So when I was deciding what I wanted to do, I decided I wanted the Strat 2 licensing. I wanted to work with students with behavioral disorders and really specialize in that field. So that was 2020 and I started my master's in June of 2020. So we had just gone home from, like we got sent home from school. We did not come back after spring break. I'm sure everyone can remember what 2020 looked like for you and your schools. They sent us on spring break. We never came back from it. Chris and I actually had a trip planned. We were gonna go to Arizona to do spring training baseball and do a little trip there and we never got on the plane because we were afraid like that's when everything was starting to shut down. I remember leaving, we had just got done on parent-teacher conferences. That's how we always scheduled those parent-teacher conferences right into spring break and our comp days buddied up with spring break. So we got like a couple extra days on top of that too. And so we had gone with some coworkers to go and get a drink after conferences were done and really excited to go home and pack and get on a plane the next day. And then I remember sitting there the scene on the news that they had canceled the NCAA tournament and we looked at each other like we're not getting on a plane tomorrow because who knows if we're gonna be able to come back like it feels like the world is shutting down and it kind of did for a while now had we gone there spring training like baseball games got canceled like we would have been everything was closing down so we wouldn't have been able to do much but then yeah I don't know we probably would have had to rent a car to have gone back it was a good thing that we didn't end up going all that to say, my last months of teaching fifth grade and that group of students really got taken away from us and we didn't get to finish with those kids. We just got sent home and then I was packing up a classroom, not just for the year, but like we were leaving. We had both accepted new jobs and hadn't told anybody yet. We were like waiting towards closer to the end of the year to tell our students that we weren't gonna be returning. But yeah, that was wild. We never got to really say goodbye to them. Uh, and yeah, I decided then though, like during that semester before all the craziness happened that I wanted to start my master's and that's what I was gonna get it in. So I started it that summer. I packed up my apartment, we moved across state. I started my master's and then started a new job in a new district, new grade level, teaching third grade. Uh, that year, the district that I was in then started in this hybrid model. So I was both the in-person and online teacher so and then we were doing this hybrid thing where i had kids split up into like an a group and a b group and so the a group kids came every other day and then the b group kids came every other day and if it wasn't your in-person day you were expected to log on at home and be doing virtual learning from home that day it was a mess there, you know, the kids, if they even logged in, were not paying attention and didn't get anything from that lesson. So we finally learned like trying to pace everything and keep everybody caught up to pace. Half the kids wouldn't even log on if they were at home that day and supposed to log on. It, it was a mess. I had 28 kids on my roster. Um, I had 13 of them with behavior goals, either on a IEP already staffed with behavior goals or we're on a tier two intervention plan where I was tracking their data all day for behavior goals and you know starting some behavior plans with them. 
but it was the most intense year of my life. And then I was on a new grade level, new school district, new curriculum for everything, trying to keep kids engaged in person and online at the same time. And I had to record every single lesson so that if the kid didn't show up and log on, it was recorded and I was responsible for going back at the end of the day and posting it so that they could go back and watch that lesson. It was so much. And I was trying to do my master's. I was trying to start my master's. It was so much all at once. I truly cannot think of like a harder year just all together in my life that I, I lived in. So anyways, we were, yeah away from home for that year. And then Chris decided he wanted to come back home and get an admin job here. So we moved back again and that's when I got my first job in special ed. Now I was only one year into my master's program and so I got hired for my BD job on a conditional license with the condition that I was finishing my schoolwork and would be licensed. And, and so I did, I finished my license, my first year teaching here. Although I had a lot of great experience from the gen ed side of things, I didn't really know what <laughs> I was in for, or what I was doing when I accepted this position. I had worked with BD teachers before. I had students on my roster with behavior goals and who were on BD rosters, but I think it just district to district and even school to school, the way it runs and what it looks like is just different for everybody so there were just a lot of growing pains and having to figure out like how I was going to run things and what it was going to look like we've there's been a huge learning curve but I have learned a lot and I think you know we've for the most part have good systems in place and I like the way things run here is it challenging absolutely are there still things that are very puzzling to me and student behaviors that were like I am struggling to understand yep I had an instant today where, you know, I talked to my AEA psychologist and everyone working with this child and we're just really struggling to identify a function for it, a trigger when you talk about all of the functions listed and you're doing ABA behavioral analysis, like the situation that happened today, all of those functions were met and the trigger doesn't like, I'm just, <laughs> we're struggling to identify what it is. And if you can't find a trigger and you're not sure on the function, it's really hard to change anything about your behavioral planning and programming. So anyways, I feel like I got on a tangent there. All that to say, yes, there are still things that are challenging and I'm learning every day and we're continuing to like try new things and meet kids where they're at. I do see even in the nine years now that I've been in education, a huge increase in behavioral, social, emotional needs. I think COVID had a huge effect on that but I also think just the use of technology has had a huge effect on that too because it allows kids to just be glued to a screen constantly and constantly entertained and then they come to school and they've got no attention span because we're used to being like constantly entertained with all these flashy things over stimulation constantly and it's impossible for a teacher to stand in front of the room and keep up with it and kids who have not had the proper brain development because they've been put in front of a screen for X amount of time without actual parenting and human interaction. Now I'm not trying to like minimize the effect of other mental health challenges and other things that play a factor. Like this, what I just mentioned is not the sole factor, but I do think it plays a part in it. And I don't say, think that that is the situation for every family at home who's struggling with kids with behavioral challenges, but I do think it plays a huge effect in it. And it really makes me analyze how we are parenting moving forward as well. If you are new to my channel, welcome. But this far into it, I guess it's uh, appropriate now to mention that I'm a new foster mom. And so I do have a child at home that we are now parenting and it's like moving towards long-term adoption and yeah, we are uh, parenting a child with trauma and trying to figure out how we appropriately use technology, but also know that like that's not going to fix the trauma and the brain development in their brain that needs to, that we need to go back and address the skills that he doesn't have. Like there's a lot of other interventions that we're going to have to put in place and a lot of therapy and teaching and relearning skills and developing skills that he doesn't have. And so anyways, in the nine years I've been doing this, I've seen huge increase in that, even just in the 
general population of students. And yeah, the it you know, job security for me, I guess, because we've got a lot of kids we're making a lot of success with, but it's slow going, it's really slow going, and there's a lot of skills that have to be worked on and it takes a long time to master these skills. They're hard and the kids that we're working with have trauma and they've got other challenges that they're working through, a lot of mental health things that also play a factor and it's something that I'm not trained to deal with. I'm not a therapist, so I can run a great inter behavior intervention plan. I feel, you know, pretty confident in my ability to go through an ABA plan and figure out antecedents and preventative strategies around those things and figure out what the skill deficit is that we need to build up for that student and focus instruction on. It's uh, a work in progress always and a challenge keeps us on our toes. I hope that answered my question or the question of what my journey was from going from gen ed to special ed. The main reason I switched was just because in teaching gen ed I just continually found myself drawn towards students with these challenges. I remember feeling very burnt out of I want to help this student with this problem and I'm spending this much time trying to address this issue and help the student with it but now I need to turn around and teach the rest of the classroom and that felt exhausting and I really wanted to be able to have the time and energy to devote towards helping the students and who really needed that extra love and support and really hone in on those things. I do not regret it for a second. I do not envision myself ever going back to the gen ed setting. Now I suppose I should never say never, but I just at this point don't envision myself ever going back. Is it easier than being in gen ed? No. There are things that are different about it. So like for example, I have fewer students on my caseload. I have nine kids on my caseload right now. Technically 11, that's a different situation. There are 11 kids that I am the caseload manager for and do their data for, but truly kids that I'm like serving minutes for daily and responding to situations, there are nine kids. So nine kids is obviously fewer than the 27 I had the year I was teaching third grade uh, or 28. Uh, I also don't have, you know, parent teacher conferences as many to go to or as much to prep for that. But on the flip side of that, I have data I'm inputting every single day for their IEPs, for their behavior goals, for their reading, writing, math goals every day. I still have to respond to behavior challenges and then turn around and come and teach a lesson to who's ever next on my SDI schedule for the day. So there are those things that are different. Uh, I do feel there's a little bit more flexibility as far as like there are fewer students who are relying on me and I can kind of come help with something, come back to what I was doing, go go back and help and it's you know not as many students in the room that are affected by it but also the behaviors are a lot more intense that I'm dealing with now than when I was in the gen ed setting. When it got to a certain intensity level I called somebody who came and helped and was able to respond to that student. Now I am the person that gets called so just what I do day to day looks differently but it's uh oh yeah there's still a lot of days where I go home and I'm extremely tired and exhausted. I do feel stuck a lot of the time that I am stuck in this I feel so passionate about what I'm doing but I'm also emotionally and mentally exhausted and tapped out from it as well so it's been a hard balance that I'm trying to learn and figure out but I don't regret it I'm glad where I'm at I don't envision myself going back to gen ed I'm thankful that I am now able to really spend the time and devote myself to the things that I am more passionate about and that is helping students with the social emotional growth that they have and helping us work through those behavioral challenges. That's where I'm at. Each position has its own challenges and things that are benefits, pros and cons to both. I think for you, if you are trying to decide which direction you want to go or if this is something that you might be interested in, I think you should one like find someone who's doing the position you think you're interested in and see if you can get in there and observe would be great if you could you know if you're in school still try to get practicum hours and just experience in that position uh, if you're already in the teaching world and you're trying to decide through it go talk to colleagues who are doing that job uh, or just to other people you know who are doing that job and find out as, as much about it 
as you can, but ultimately I think you have to ask yourself what you're passionate about and what you want to spend your time doing. For me, this is where I was passionate and where I wanted to move my direction and spend my time at. For you that, you know, maybe you really are passionate about curriculum and instruction. And that's not to say I'm not. I do, I get, I will geek out all day over data and curriculum instruction and best instructional practices. I still do academic minutes with my students and I still feel very strongly about strong teaching practices and using things that are research-based and strong, sound teaching practices. So that's not to say I'm not. I just, you know, if I'm going to pick one or the other, this is where I want to spend the chunk of my time. So I think you have to decide that for yourself, find out as much information about it or observe or get as much experience in the area you're contemplating as you can. And yeah, make, you gotta make the best decision that's for you. That's not to say that I'm gonna be in this position forever either because now that we are starting a family and I'm parenting a child and a child with needs, I do need to make some challenges and, or not challenges, make some decisions and set some boundaries to make it realistic for my family that I can continue to do this and still give my family my best afterwards as well. So with that, I'm gonna close the video out. Please comment down below if there are any further questions that you have about this, anything that you're wondering that I didn't address, or maybe I said something that sparked a new question that you had. So please comment below. I'd love to connect with you on it. Uh, and if you haven't already, subscribe so that you can stick around and see any of my future uploads. I appreciate you being here. And with that, I will see you in the next one. Bye.